Hello and welcome to Indie Game Arcade, a podcast all about the love of independent video games. In this episode, we're talking about Shogun Showdown, which I almost wanted to call Samurai Showdown, which is a totally different game. But in my head all week, I kept thinking Samurai Showdown, and that is wrong. My name is Chris. And I'm Joseph. And I was also thinking Samurai Showdown the whole time I was... (laughs) Like, every time I would think about this game, I was like, all right, I know it's got Shogun in there, but where is it? Because is it Showdown? And then I was... It, like, I kept doubting the showdown part because of Samurai Showdown. I uh, went to type it into Steam to get, like, the developer info the other day, and I typed in Samurai Showdown, and I was like, hmm, this doesn't seem right. <laughs> this looks completely different. There's no pixels. So, yeah. But Shogun Showdown released just recently. It was September 5th, so it's only been out a few weeks since the time we're recording this. This was developed by Robotino and published by Goblins Publishing and Gamera Games. So mm. I appreciate that name. I figured you would too, because yes, yes. Gamera is like your favorite kaiju of all time. That's my boy. Your boy. He's your friend uh, to all children. Friend to all children. Friend yes. to Joseph, specifically. Friend yes. to Joseph. Friend to child Joseph. For a quick <laughs> description, Shogun Showdown is a turn-based combat game with roguelike and deck-building elements. Position yourself and attack at the right time, Upgrade your tiles and combo them to get ready to fight the Shogun. I never found the Shogun. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I, you did. I want to preface it by saying that I've I've cleared this game three times now. Holy um, crap. Or oh, when I say right. clear, I just mean like I've gotten to the Shogun and defeated the Shogun three times. And so I can okay. explain it from the perspective of what happens after that. And I guess you can kind of touch on where you've gotten so far. Yeah, I can explain it from the perspective of somebody that has failed every time he's played (laughs) the game. As far as, like, a story for this game, there's really no story to it. I mean, it's basically that you're a lone wanderer hunting down the Shogun, and you got to go through a bunch of enemies to get to him. And that's pretty much it. And, you know, there's nothing really spelled out in the game. It's just kind of how it goes. Well, I do want to touch on that real quick. Since we're talking about story, sure. this is one of those where you don't get anything really initially. But as you go through the game, even if you like lose, like there's always like a cut scene at the end of it where this stranger, mysterious stranger is like talking to you to your character or at least a character and they're kind of fleshing out the story as you go and as you beat it you're kind of getting a little bit more revealed each time so the story is like initially it's just like hey it's just a cool like Jap- feudal japanese setting where i'm a ninja or a samurai or whatever fighting to you know defeat the shogun but then it slowly starts to like unravel things where i know there was mention of like a father there was something called like the scarring so i there's like all kinds of lore to it that you just have to kind of unravel as you go interesting so it's all kind of locked down within the context of the gameplay the farther you get the more becomes unlocked that's yes. really cool i like that yeah so i i think what's really cool about that is for someone specifically like yourself who's more of like a lore person that is also like lore being unlocked as you go through the story, not just More like new characters, lore. new cards, whatever. Unlocked. Yeah, I like that a lot. One thing I did want to call out real quick, too, before we get to the gameplay and the mechanics is did you notice the cameos that were off to the left on the menu screen each time you're about to do your run? No, I didn't. So it it's right by where you when you're on the menu screen. Let's say you finish a run or you die and don't finish that run, which is my case every time. You can move over to the left side of the screen to buy stuff with those skull tokens that you earn for killing bosses. Yeah. So over towards that left part of the screen, in the background, you can see Hollow Knight or I I don't know that it is Hollow Knight, but it's a Hollow Knight character. I do think it's Hollow Knight. I haven't played the game. And you can see Isaac from Binding Isaac. Binding of Isaac. Just chilling. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Just wow. chilling I, there. I, I just didn't notice that. I'll have to look next time. Yeah. Next time you go there, you'll see it and then you can't unsee it. And then every time it's going to make you smile a little bit. So I was trying to look and see. I was like, did they make those games? They didn't. 
No. I don't know what the deal was there. They just must really like them. Maybe they're friends of them. Maybe the publishers had something to do with those games. I'm not sure, but it was a cool little cameo. I feel like there's like an indie game kind of click where they all kind of just talk to each other and like, hey, can we have your characters like cameo in our game? Things oh, like absolutely that. Absolutely, there because is. Because you see it yes. all the time. And I don't know if it's like a whole. Like in my head, my head canon is it like they're just like, yeah, go ahead, use it. Like it's it's all for good fun. But I'm sure like people, there's probably like money being involved or whatever. But I, in my mind, Could they're be. just sharing the characters because of the love of the the um, indie game scene. Yeah, I like that idea a lot. We're creating a game, and I would totally love to see our <laughs> characters show up in other people's games. Yeah, exactly. It's like free advertisement, right? So that's why exactly. I, I and also I say this with the hope that like we could also like use some of their characters <laughs> hey, in cameos in our games for free. Yeah, give us your characters. We need them, please. <laughs> so let's go ahead and talk about the gameplay and the mechanics of this. And I'm going to leave that to you per the usual, because you are our gameplay and mechanics sort of guru here. Okay, so as you said, it is a tactical kind of deck building game in a sense. And I mean that in a really loose sense, like you're not drawing cards per se, but you have these tiles that are in front of you. These are your attacks or your movement, things like that. And what happens is... Like, let's say you have uh, an arrow in one of your slots, then that arrow does a specific thing. It has, like, two damage initially, travels across the screen. And these, like, when I say screen, I mean, like, you're in a really, like, compressed area of about eight tiles, I think, is the biggest it gets. And it's a 2D side-scrolling kind of situation where you're jumping from tile to tile, left or right, to both avoid enemy attacks and place yourself in a advantageous position to where your attacks will do a certain thing. And this is turn-based. So you're getting to see like what's happening. Unlike the game that we just covered. Dice Folk? Yes. I was trying to remember the name of it. Unlike unlike Dice Folk. I gotcha. Thank you. You're not acting for the enemy. The enemy is acting independently And so you're having to react to what they're doing. Position yourself to where it's like, okay, if I go here, am I going to be hit by the enemy? And is my attack going to hit the enemy? And or luckily you attack first. So you can position yourself where it's like, all right, I'm going to attack first. They have three life left. My attack does four damage. I can math this out. I know I'm going to win because I strike first. And you're really trying to do that. And that sounds like really simple, like on the surface. But what really complicates it is when you have like four or five enemies on the screen at a time and they're all acting independently. And it's like, okay, if I put myself here, is this guy way over here going to do something and hit me if I'm trying to get this guy? So that's where it's like your positioning, your car, your tile tactics and everything come into play. You're also able to upgrade each of your tiles a certain number of times. They'll have bubbles above them that'll show you the amount of times you can upgrade these. And by upgrading, you're adding like extra damage, extra uh, cooldown or quicker cooldown time. Because as you use a tile, they will have to cool down for a certain number of turns. And those turns are every time you move, every time you act and everything else. So you're really kind of calculating all these things together to form a uh, synergy, like, what is the word for it? Like, um, synergy combo. Well, I was going to say like synergistic and I didn't know, I didn't know if that was actually a word. It's yeah, not, but, but I do like that. So maybe we could keep that. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep that so in our back pocket. You're trying to form like a really synergistic playthrough with all of your abilities working together. So If you've got a spear, then that does, you know, a certain thing. So it's like you obviously don't need this other weapon. It doesn't do a thing that will help complement the spear. So and you're also adding things like potentially poison or freeze or things like that. So there's a lot of layers here. The more complicated you get and pretty much every turn or every round of play, you are able to purchase different tiles that you can have in your deck for later usage and these are kind of random the the roguelike of it all is that these are randomly drawn as you progress through the the run 
And so you don't know exactly what's going to come up, but just like any roguelike, as you unlock them, there is a chance that a new one will come up and then you can add that to your deck. And none are necessarily inherently better than the others. It's all situational. So that's what I really appreciate. It's not like I've got this giant thing. Now I have a nuke and I'm going to use this nuke and destroy everything and I win. <laughs> There's no like easy game winning thing like that. It's all just like what will work best in my current situation. You could like literally power like one arrow, your arrow tile up like crazy make it do like nine damage or something. And then like, yeah, I'm going to use this arrow for the rest of my run. Like, why wouldn't I? And that's one of your starting abilities. So that all is to say there's a lot of variety to it. Do you have anything to add to that? I've said a lot. Yeah. One, one of the things that also complicates just the entire play style of everything is that when you have those tiles below you and you want to use them, as an attack or a movement or something. So how it works is that each turn is you can either move like right or you can move to the left. That would be a turn. And each time you do something, the enemy also gets a turn. So they also can move or something every time you do something. So yes. what you do triggers the enemy to do something. In addition, if you want to use a move like an attack or a tile that creates a movement, you're not just doing it. There are three slots above your character's head, which is basically like a deck, and you are adding those tiles to that. You don't have to add three to use them, but you do have to basically put them on your deck before you can use them. So you're also having to plot, let's say, okay, I want to use this arrow, but before you can use that arrow, you do have to add it to that deck, basically to ready your weapon. You're thinking about to take out these enemies. I have to not only think about my position, but how long will it take me to get my deck set up to, let's say, use a grappling hook to pull this enemy closer, hit him with my sword, and then shoot my arrow at this other enemy, how many turns is that going to take? And how many attacks or movements are the enemies going to get if I'm trying to do all those things? So it's sort of a, it's very, very strategic, almost like a game of chess in a way, because you're having to really think about every single move you make and not just moving your character around the, sh the screen, but every single action that you're going to take is an opportunity for your opponent to also take an action against you or ready an action against you as well. So that is where a lot of stuff can either create a situation where you can create an amazing combo and take out a bunch of enemies at once, or you might miss something and you end up in a situation, as per me, who sometimes doesn't like to think things through when uh, it's necessary, and you set yourself up for failure a little bit. But I do yeah. want to point out, though, that I wouldn't call this game unforgiving or anything in that sense. This game, one, it, it's very fun. I really enjoy it. But even though like I kept losing... And I would say I, I maybe attempted six or seven runs and I got fairly far in them. I got through at least three or four bosses, I think. I actually don't know how long a run is, so I don't know if that is far, honestly. It might not be. But I would say I would get through at least three bosses every time. Maybe there was four once or twice. I'm not sure. But every time I died, it never felt unfair. It always felt felt like it was my fault. And and every time it was just like, oh man, I died because of this. Like it was always very obvious what I did wrong and that it was me that did it. You never feel like you got put in an impossible situation. There's always a way out of it. It's just a matter of can you think your way out of it strategically? Yeah, and I would highly recommend keeping the uh, I don't know what it's called, but it's like the sh um, like teleport replace kind of 
tool in your action bar whenever possible. And what that does is it lets you literally trade places with the enemy that you are looking at uh, directly in front of you. Is that and the smoke bomb? Yeah, yeah, the, the smoke bomb that. one that, that replaces you because that sets you up in situations where it's like, I'm about to get hit if I let this turn go and I'm trapped where I am, but if I use my replace tool, then it will teleport this one dude in front of me to where I am, then he'll get hit and I won't and all is well. But there have been so many times where that specific move has saved my life because I've either either planned it out or not planned it out and been like, oh crap, I'm in a bad spot. I really need to get out of this. Sure. And that's saved my life. One time I got, there's this cool weapon. I don't know if you've unlocked it yet, but it's it's a big sword and it just says zero on it. It does zero damage initially, but the longer you hold it up in your queue, the more damage it does up to nine. And at one oh. point, there was one game that I happened upon two of those swords. So I had two of them in my deck. Oh my gosh. I, I had them both up in my queue and then was able to jump around enough to where they both got fully powered up to nine. And I had a curse on the boss. And what a curse does is it lets you do double damage for one hit to the next thing you hit. So it did 18 damage and then nine damage. So I did just 27 uh, damage in one hit to this boss because I had just stacked those swords. That's what I'm talking about. The synergy in this is so cool when you can get this nice setup, just like any good roguelike where it just feels really good that you've set this up yourself and now you're just a killing machine. When you were talking about the smoke bomb and how useful that is and how many times that's saved you, which it has me too. I've also killed myself multiple times or like n not necessarily killed myself, but put myself in bad situations with it multiple times mm. by not accounting for the fact that turning around to face your enemy is also a turn. Oh, so yes. using the, the smoke bomb, let's say to an enemy that's across the screen that I'm facing and I'm trying to get myself out of a situation and I'll do that, but then I don't account for the extra turn to turn around. And in uh. that time, <laughs> another enemy has something ready to go. Let's say an arrow or there's those little ones that have that shadow dash that can just like shoot themselves across the screen oh, and yeah, slam into annoying. you. So like, it'll be like one of those or something. And I don't have, you know, the wiggle room to do anything about it because I'm not facing them. I have to use that turn to turn around. And by that time it's like, okay, I got to get hit. That sucks. <laughs> I've, I've done that to myself more times than I can count. And every time I'm like, oh, why did I do that again? <laughs> have you, what character are you using? Are you just using the starting uh, I like only have girl? I've only got two unlocked right now. I have the starting character and then I have the Ronin that has the spear yeah. and the grappling hook. Yeah, the Ronin is who I've won my matches with. And the, the yeah. good, well, good and bad part, I guess, depending on how you look at it, is like, if you if you beat it with whatever whatever character you beat it with, like that's the character you're going to have to keep beating it with to get to the preceding days. And when I say days, it's like after you beat a game or sorry, after you beat a run, it turns into like the next day. And so it's like interesting. Uh, the characters unlock up to day three, I think, is where the final character you get unlocked is and I just got that like that's what I wanted to do before we started this was do another run through so I could see if I could beat the third day and I did and that's what so now I have all the characters but I've only really used the Ronin because I I like his push so much it's just so nice I'll I'll jump around and use the other characters now that I've unlocked them but the Ronin's been my go-to to beat the three days so far yeah, each character that you can use also has a special ability. So the starting character, if you are facing an enemy and you are standing right in front of them, sort of like the smoke bomb, you can trade places with them. However, with with this ability, it's you have to be literally right in front of them, whereas the smoke bomb, you can do it from across the screen or wherever. Mm. So that's the ability for 
the Wanderer, that very first character, and those hero abilities have a cooldown to them as well, just like your regular moves. The Ronin that you were talking about has a shove ability where you can shove them across the map and they will run into the next opponent and and do you collision can do damage. damage. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really cool. And I did get an unlock one run that allowed me to upgrade that damage too, which was really nice, especially when you're going up against a lot of those one and two HP characters. So just shoving one into the others and then you just wipe them out that way. That's yeah. been really handy. Yeah, that's nice. There's also there's multiple unlocks for their abilities. I've only used the Ronin, so I don't know what anybody else's are like. But one of his is like It'll either do an extra damage or you can have one, uh, an ability attached to it that lets you push both backing up and forward. So you don't have to turn around to push them. You can just like back into them and it'll still push them back. And that's super nice because you don't have to waste a turn, like you said, turning around just to push something out of your way. And I just like that there's so many like little mechanical things you can do, even to the character abilities that makes them potentially more useful But I will say like gold is very sparse in this game. So you have to really think about what you're going to choose because you will not be able to afford it all. Yeah. Every time you get to a shop, which there's a few different places and it's always once you beat a slew of enemies, it's always like you get through like three stages or four stages and then there's a boss that you fight and then there's kind of a split path where you choose to go to one shop or another shop and there's different things depending on there. Like there might be upgrades for your combos and skills and stuff or there might be a shop that's more about replacing your tiles and things like that so you kind of have to make those decisions and then when you get there yeah you cannot afford everything there and usually you can't afford more than one thing in my experience so far so really it's just like do i want to buy something or do i want to upgrade something i already have so yeah it's a lot of decision making throughout the the entire game One thing that I did want to ask you about is the bosses. I've only run into so many since I haven't gotten super far, but do you have any bosses that really stood out to you, whether you really liked them or you really disliked them? Because all the bosses tend to have like a different style or strategy or something. Yeah, so I wanted to say, and I maybe this is incorrect i'm not sure but the way that i think it's worked is after you beat it the first time then it kind of expands to where you get multiple pathway choices instead of just like i have to go to this next island i have to go to this next island like to the point where it's like sometimes it branches out into where you can go to three different ones so it's like okay i i don't remember if that was available during my first run my first couple runs before i actually beat it But I just want to say that, like, yeah, so it does expand out, meaning that there are going to be more bosses you can run into. There was one that was at least memorable to me, uh, Nobunaga. He was really cool because I didn't know how to fight him at first. Like, he's just this, like, mask with, like, a robe on or cloak or something. And I was attacking him, and it was doing, like, no damage. I was like, okay, what's going on here? And then I saw like there were these lights overhead like that were like shining spotlights onto each of the tile, like some of the tiles, like two or three of the tiles. And anytime he would step into that, like the cloak would reveal like a heart inside. And that's when you could attack him. But you would have to get him into the position to where you could actually strike him. Otherwise, he's invulnerable or he's invincible until you are able to get him into those lights. And it's not that he like purposely avoids them or anything. It's just that he's also summoning other enemies in the meantime. And, you know, he's trying to attack you. And so you're trying to position, you have to position yourself and account for the fact that, oh, he's not in the light. So it's useless to do an attack right now. I need to wait for him to jump into this light, but I also have to watch this enemy behind me. So it was a really like interactive kind of boss. And that was why it kind of stood out to me. All the bosses have like really unique mechanics to them. 
there was one, the twins. I know you fought the twins because I saw that yeah, you beat them the on twins. their Steam thing. That was a cool one because it was like they're they start on either side of you and they're kind of encroaching on you and both trying to attack you at the same time. This is where the the shadow, the smoke bomb replace like really comes in handy. Cause then as they're both trying to attack you, you just swap places and make them attack each other. And so it's not necessarily that that's a hard boss. It's one of the starting bosses, but it was an interesting boss. There's also these statues that yes. one of them, they're I both stationary. I want to talk about that. Yeah. Yes. One of them just has like, a, I don't know, like 10 health or something. And the other one's doing a string of attacks the whole time. And so you need to take out the one that has 10 health first because it's summoning other enemies in while the one on the right is attacking. And so that one's kind of like, okay, do I take out this one on the left first or do I let some of the do I let him summon some of the enemies so that they can take those hits that the other one's going to do? And so that's where it's like a lot of decision making and depending on your setup, how you want to approach it. Yeah, that boss to me was a little disappointing just because I felt like it was too easy. I just saw the, and I know that you were you were thinking like you can make that decision and stuff. To me, it was just like, well, of course, I'm going to take out the one that has that smaller health pool and is summoning those other mobs, those ads first. And so like you just go over there because the big thing is those two bosses, they don't move. So if you are three tiles basically like away, you're kind of like mostly out of range of the majority of the attacks the other statue can do. So you go, you kill the one, and then you just kind of hop back over and then you take out the other one. It, it's it was yeah. it's fairly easy. I've never had trouble with that one in, nope. in any capacity. The only time that one becomes a little bit more challenging is when the one on the right starts doing ranged attacks. And then yes. that's when you're like, well, I can't block this because I killed the one who summons stuff that would block it. And so because you can't do a, a shadow like switch with these since they're statues. Uh, Unless so you have a shield, then you yeah, can block it. You could shield it. You could block it in that yeah. way. But that's the only time to your point it really becomes challenging at all. Yeah. As long as you know, like, take out the left one first and the right one, like, you're probably golden. And for the most part, he will just be doing moves that maybe have a range of two from where he is, but no further. So, like you said, three tiles away, you're safe. Then you jump in, do your stuff, jump out. So, that's one. I think it's like this either the second or third boss. I can't remember. Pretty easy. But like I said, once you beat it, then it expands to where you can go different routes and fight different bosses and stuff. And that's where it becomes like some of them, none of them have been like super challenging in the sense that like I've had a ton of issue with, not that they haven't killed me before, but none of them seem unfair in any way. Right. Even like the the actual Shogun, like he wasn't too bad. He's definitely the hardest of the bunch, but still not too bad, manageable. Yeah, sure. what is... What does that boss fight feel like? So, of course, like any good final boss, he's got two forms. So you have to make sure you get to the first one while he is. He has these two statues to the left and right of him and also on the, the edges of the screen. They can be destroyed, but they have so much health and you don't know how much health they actually have. So it's not even really worth your time to destroy them unless you just have a ton of damage that you're outputting. But what they're doing is summoning enemies, putting a shield on him, and the, I don't think the statues do any attacking, but they're shielding him so much and summoning other enemies that it's like you need to kind of burn through the Shogun as fast as you can because once his second form starts, those statues like go away. They break apart, and then he's just all his second form. And the second form is just mainly like a you're kind of trying to survive as he's throwing a bunch of different attacks at you. Nothing too crazy, but if you had a lot of trouble in the first form, then your health is going to be pretty low, so you got to really be careful. Uh, I don't think he throws anything at you that's, like, unblockable or whatever, but he will kind of trick you up with some, like, trading places with you or teleporting across the screen. So what's generally been your strategy going up against him? I know you said, like, try to burn him down as fast as possible, but if he's constantly yeah. getting his shield, is it more along the lines of, just setting up, you know, 
your first attack is obviously going to be meant to break the shield and then the rest of the attacks are meant to damage him or what's your strategy there? Yeah, I would say my initial strategy would be uh, burn him down if you can, because even though they're putting shields up, it's still periodical enough to where you can fit attacks in between all that. And if you're the Ronin, you can kind of use his summons against him by pushing them into him and stuff. So In my experience, it's been a lot of that, like pushing his enemy or pushing his allies into him, kind of trying to trap him in a corner along with his statues. Because if I can hit some of his statues at the the same time I'm hitting him, since the Ronin has that spear, I will do that a lot to see if I can maybe burn one of them down to make it a little easier on myself. But first form has never really been a huge issue. Second form is where it can get a little dicey, depending on how much health you have left over. But I've, I think I've gotten through where I've only taken like one hit and even that hit was shielded. So I didn't take wow. any damage from him on maybe my second run through him. That's crazy. But that is really dependent on your setup. Like if you have a right. good, cause I remember at that time I had this ability that ever, at the start of every battle, it would give me a free shield. It took two of my health permanently away, but I would get a free shield at the start of a battle. So that to me was a fair trade off. And that shield like really protected me from taking a ton of like unnecessary damage. Yeah, I had a skill at one point that I ended up getting that was every time I got hit, it gave me a shield so yeah. that if I were to get hit again, I would be shielded. And so that way I would get multiple shields. But obviously I, I haven't gotten that far with it. So it hasn't helped me that much. But that's because I lack some critical thinking skills sometimes. It's interesting, like, how how undefeated you were at yeah. the last game Dice at Folk. Dice Folk. And then yeah. this one, like, I, I was kind of looking at your achievements on Steam to see if, like, okay, how far have you gotten? And I saw that you hadn't beaten the Shogun yet, but I was curious, like, what your opinion of this game was because of that. Yeah. The farthest I've gotten, I've gotten past the third boss for sure. And like I said, I just don't remember how many bosses there were, but I have fought the there's that first boss you get then there's the boss that dashes and then there are the twins and then there's the statues i've beat all four of those okay so i I haven't gotten farther than those i feel like there's only maybe three or four bosses before the shogun but they can be kind of like interchangeable depending on the path that you take sure one thing that we didn't touch on that much is the combos which is something that they really try to i I guess not they don't like hammer it home but they really do try to highlight the idea of doing combos which is the ability to kill multiple enemies at one time which just makes you feel really good every time you pull a good combo off yeah and that's just like really being smart and setting up a good tile deck and just kind of maximizing the potential of the situation where you might use that one ability. There's that one sword that attacks both in front and behind in just one swing. And then maybe you're also shooting an arrow at someone and doing something else so you could potentially take out quite a few enemies in one move which is pretty cool i've watched some videos of people online playing some of this i even saw some speed runs which blew my mind how fast some people can play this game i don't know how they do it but there's been some pretty cool ones but what's been your biggest combo because the the biggest one i've had so far is only three but i i was kind of figuring that you've probably had a bigger one the last game i had actually i had just unlocked these kunai which are these like kind of throwing daggers and i had put poison on all of them and what happens with the kunai is like let's say you have a four damage kunai that doesn't mean they do four damage each it means you throw four of them so that's where wow. you can really start to stack those combos up. You, you throw four that do one damage each, I, I mean to say. Yeah. So it's like I, I, I had a situation where I had my spear, which goes through two enemies and right. uh, can and it was like doing five damage at the time. So that's like Jeez. instant death for most enemies. And then I yeah. had a four kunai. So that was throwing four daggers. So I think that four 
people at most might have been my max combo just because of this last game I had where I stabbed through two of them, kill them, and then throw kunai and it, at these two that had two health each. So that means it goes one, two, kills one of them, and then three, four, kills the other one because it's throwing wow. like four separate daggers. So that was my best run. I, I'm sure people have gotten like 100 kills or something. That's just not what my <laughs> focus was right now. My focus is survival. And so I'm just trying to live. And if I get a combo, yeah. you know, so much the better. Do you have any favorite weapons? I know that I just unlocked one that has quickly become my favorite, which is the trap. And oh, that one, yeah, the trap's cool. The, the base damage, I think was, I don't remember three. if it's three or four. It's okay, three. three. Yeah. And I had upgraded to four and early in the game, like that's instant death for almost everything except those really big, big dudes. So with the trap, what you're doing is you're literally laying down what looks like a bear trap on the tile in front of you, but it doesn't hurt you if you walk over it. So you can still move wherever you want. But that is so fun because I will just keep laying them down it, especially if you get that cooldown down quite a bit, then you can just keep laying them. And then as enemies walk towards you to try to get in range to hit you with something that isn't a ranged weapon. I mean, it's literally just eating them up. And that yeah. feels so good when they walk over a trap. That is fun. And also, like, standing in your own trap, you could do a smoke replace and make someone jump into your own trap purposely. Yes, I, so it's, it's I did do that, and that felt amazing. Yeah, so there's some really fun combos and fun weapons here. And like I said, they all have a different kind of balance to them. So I don't think any are like inherently the best weapon. It just depends on your preferred play style or how you want to do that run. Yeah. What do you think about the the art style and the sound of this game, the music and everything? Art style is great. Like it's a nice, simple, like pixelated style, but it's still got like a really kind of beautiful aesthetic to it. I love yeah. the colors, how a lot of it's just kind of like um, mono color backgrounds. Like you've got a, a greenish one, a red one, a brown one. Yeah. Like there's just different kind of hues that are part of the background. And then the music is just such a, such a cool, like kind of traditional, like Japanese sound. Like what you would think of when you're thinking about like a samurai or a, a ninja kind of game. It's got that in yeah. the background. And it just at some points gets like really kind of heated, like when you especially when you're in boss fights, like it, it starts going like faster and faster. And then it's like you can even though you're sitting there and it's turn based between turns, you can feel the pressure, the tension rising because you're just listening to that fast beat. And you're like, oh, I got to make a decision. I got to make a decision. Even though you're not <laughs> timed, you feel like you need to hurry up because this beat is going faster than your uh, it's going, I guess it's upping your adrenaline is how it makes me feel. Yeah, I think my favorite so far that I've seen, I I believe it's called the, is it the open night market or something? Yeah. Where you're on like the rooftops and it's night and you see the stars and everything. It just, it looks so beautiful. Just the background and everything, it's gorgeous. The enemies yeah. are all, like those designs are all so good. All the bosses specifically, the designs are top notch on those they all look really distinct and have really cool um it just seems like there's a lot of personality in the designs of those bosses which i really really like oh yeah like it's all around like it just looks great it feels great and it sounds great it's just a great game yeah it is a great game so i assume you would recommend this to folks huh Absolutely. I don't. OK, here's what I'll say, though. Like, if you just listen to our last episode about Dice Folk, I would say if you're just starting into roguelikes, maybe do Dice Folk first, because that one, I think, conceptually and maybe even mechanically is easier than this one, or at least like a smoother start. This one can get a little challenging, but it is very rewarding, I'll say. So yeah. this isn't like a knock at it for being too hard or anything. I'm just saying like progression wise start with dice folk move to this one and i think you'll be really satisfied any other games you would compare this one to Ooh, one that i was thinking of just in the turn-based sense not a roguelike but a crypt of the necrodancer oh, where okay. you're just having to like watch what your enemies are doing than what you're doing because like every time you take a turn an enemy takes a turn in that one or i guess if you want to even take it to the zelda universe the oh yeah the, the there's, there's a hyrule version of that one i can't remember what it's called yes. exactly but 
where you're playing as Link and you're doing the exact same thing where it's like, you move, the enemy moves, you move, the enemy moves. And that's the only, that was the first thing that popped in my head. Not that it looks like it or anything, but just in the sense that like, you're really trying have to plan ahead based on where you think or know the enemy is about to move or what they're about to do. Cadence of Hyrule, that's, that's the one. That's what it is, yes. Yeah. Speaking of other games, have there been any other games that you have been playing, any other indie games? I'm okay, assuming well, you've still been playing some Elden Ring, but have you played anything else? So indie games, like I haven't really played any, at least this past week, other than Shogun Showdown, because I'm really in the midst of trying to finish up Star Wars Outlaws. Not an indie game. I understand oh, that's that, right. so I'm not going to dive too deep into that. But I, as a big Star Wars fan, am really enjoying that game. But once I finish sure. that one, I do have a number of other games I want to jump into. Specifically, there's this one called Wild Bastards that I just picked up. It's the spiritual successor to Void Bastards, which is one where, if you haven't played it, it's an FPS roguelike where you are trying to like lead prisoners through space, craft weapons... You're making things out of like staplers and like whatever, whatever you can find kitty bots and try to distract enemies while you take them down and help your fellow prisoners escape this nebula, I guess, or something to that effect. It's it's a space kind of shooter deal. And then but Wild Bastards takes that into like more of a Wild West territory, but you're still like aliens and robots. So it's still sci fi, but sci fi Wild West where you are working to resurrect your gang and get revenge so that you as outlaws can do more crime, I guess. I That's don't, cool. I don't know exactly how the story pans out, but I do know it's another FPS ro strategic roguelike where it's first-person shooter, but you have to kind of it's kind of set you up in situations where you're in these specific levels. You get to choose where you go on a I'm trying to think of a game to compare it to map wise, but it's got that like overhead map, just like any rogue, like really where you're sure. choosing your path to go out of like whatever path you want to follow. And then as you enter that little area, then you go into the smaller map that is the FPS portion of it. So that's one where it seems like a sort of chaotic, strategic game, but it, I love the way it looks, and I'm really excited to play that one after I finish Star Wars. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I'll have to check that out because I haven't seen that before, but I have seen uh, the predecessor, I think, in your Steam library, but I've never yep. really given it the time of day. I'll have to check that out. I, I started playing, uh, well, I've been playing a few other things. I jumped back into Firewatch, which is... Like, there's no reason for me to have done that, but I just really liked that game. And the last time I played it, it was like pre pandemic. And that is like a really short walking sim ish kind of game, but it's just a really pretty game. And it's like you get to walk around in like a big state park and stuff. And there's some a little bit of eeriness to it. So I just kind of wanted to replay that again because the last time I did play it, it was a live stream. So I was talking to, you know, chat and everything, and I felt like I had missed a lot of stuff. So I just kind of wanted to do it and, you know, experience everything again. So that was kind of fun. I also started Cassette Beasts just oh, because, like, yeah. that had always been... Yeah, it's always been one that I was really interested in. I, I wanted to see what it was like. But it's pretty cool. It's a really interesting spin on the monster catcher genre where you are basically becoming the monsters like the beasts and stuff with the use of recording the essence of these monsters on cassette tapes and then playing them in your walkman and then you turn into that creature to fight oh strange so it's kind of like per persona in that way somewhat yeah it's really weird but it's really cool it's got good soundtrack of course cuz this thing's so based around music but also, you know, it has a very Pokemon style setup as far as like a town that you walk around in and you're talking to folks and you have to go out and uh, you're sent out on different missions for different people. You have a companion and th that companion will change because you have to satisfy quests for different people and those people will come with you on those quests. But they will also turn into beasts and then when they do... 
you can combine with them and form a singular, oh. more powerful thing. Beast and fusion. The combinations are different depending on like what you are. And there's like, I can't remember, but there's supposed to be like hundreds if not like a thousand different combinations that you can form that way so it's pretty interesting already but like i said i'm not super far in i don't know how long the game is but it's definitely piqued my interest how many hours did you see you are into it because it sounds like yeah what you just said sounds like a lot really only two wow so there's a lot to it it sounds like i was thinking it was just going to be kind of like like a, a monster catch Thing very similar to Pokemon, but now that you're seeing that, it sounds very different from what my expectations were. Is it at least like turn-based combat in the same fashion? Yeah, definitely. the The battle system is very, very similar to okay. what you would expect. So, and also you you do get the random like you're walking around the world and someone comes up and says something stupid to you, and then you have to fight them. <laughs> like that does happen. <laughs> and you know, then steal like, their money. Yeah. Someone's just like, I saw a rock. You know, you know, <laughs> dun, that sort of. Dun, dun. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> you do get that you, sort of thing. Speaking of, like, okay, so talking about Pokemon real quick and games inspired by Pokemon, did you hear about the lawsuit that's finally going through against Pal World that Nintendo no, has filed? No, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't hear about that, but so, color me not, ex- I, like, I know. surprised. I know there was like speculation about it before, but it was all like fake. But now, like they literally have filed a lawsuit against them for patent infringements. And oh boy, yeah, those dudes are know, screwed. Well, yeah, maybe. I honestly like. I hope not. Like, however you feel about that game, I know we enjoyed it, but we did. you can you can feel however you want to about like Pokemon with guns if you want to sim- <laughs> like simplify it like that. But the NRA Pokemon, I, yeah, I think. To me, it just is so much different of a game, even if it's got like obvious inspirations from it. So I'm hoping yes. that it's not too bad because then that will really like deter people from doing things like this in the future, even if it's just like inspired by. It's just unfortunate that it has to come to this like Pokemon, like, or like Nintendo, like, you don't need any more money. Come on, like, what are you doing here? Like let oh, people I know. just have fun with your products and make their own like knockoff versions of it. It's not taking any money from you. You're still fine. Yeah, I just N- Nintendo is so freaking ruthless. I just I feel for those developers or whoever's in the crosshairs because they are going to be relentless. It's, yeah. it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. There's yeah, no they way. Love to- they left a the comments on their social media about it saying oh, that, like that it was real and that they are still, you know, encouraged to continue like creating games and things like that. So it's unfortunate that they have to are going to have to take so much time and it, to give this thing so much attention that it's going to delay the current plans they have for, you know, other products like new games sure. and things like that. And that's the really oh. bad part. It's like, these are like smaller. I don't know how big this team is or not, but I assume like relatively, obviously it's much smaller. So yeah, right. that's going to take like a lot of your manpower out because they're going to be focused on this. It's like without going into detail, it's like when you and I had to face a similar situation and yep. how much it really like made us not want to do podcasting or anything anymore. Yeah, that was not a good time. I'm not surprised because I remember when the first trailer dropped, I was like, ooh, that does look like Pokemon with guns. <laughs> yeah, but it's also like, look at these other games like Cassette Beast or I know there's a ton of other like Pokemon yeah, likes. I've played and- so many. Right. Yeah. And as far as I know, like they've been fine. They've been able to avoid it. But I think it's because of how big and viral Pal World went that it really really came under their radar. And now they're like, okay, this is the perfect time to strike now that they're popular. Yeah. It's a cutthroat world, sir. Cutthroat. Speaking of cutting throats, I've been playing Killer Frequency. Oh, okay. Okay. Which is a an indie game where you are a radio DJ for a late night radio show in a small town when a serial killer goes on a, a killing spree and starts murdering folks around town, including the sheriff. Mm. And it, because it's a small town, there's like 
no police resources. The sheriff is dead. The one deputy has gone on vacation and the only other deputy has been attacked and is out of commission. So the 911 operator dispatcher, the only one has to drive to the next town over to try to get help because the, I guess the phone or the communication or something, I don't know, plot. They (laughs) have to drive to the next town to get help. So they route all the 911 calls to you at this radio station. And so you are getting calls from people. Some are prank calls. Some are just calls for the radio station, asking for music. So you're doing your show, but also you're fielding 911 calls as this serial killer is coming after people. So you're having to make these choices, trying to get people out of this situation as this killer is trying to take them out in a very 80s slasher style. And I should mention, too, this does take place in the 80s. So everything about this is like a 1980s slasher movie. Nice. So like one of the very first calls you get in that sense is like, this woman's running. She is in a, a parking lot. There's nowhere else for her to go. You have to run through the station, find a manual from one of the other shows that does stuff about cars that tells you how to hotwire a car. And you have to try to give her the right instructions to hotwire this car so she can get out of there. If you don't, she's going to get killed by this killer. If you do it right, she'll escape. So it's like lots of stuff like that. All these situations, if you mess up, that person's going to die and it's going to be like your fault. Is this like roguelike in the sense that like if all the people die, you start over or is it just an ongoing story? Like what is the fail state of this game? It is a linear story. I have not finished it yet, but I do believe at some point this killer is probably coming for me at the station. Uh, of course. So as you're doing everything, it's start where I'm at now, you're starting to go into a direction of also trying to figure out who this killer is because they're uh, everyone's calling him the whistling man because of he whistles when he shows up and he's wearing like this mask. And apparently this is something that happened like 50 years ago, like small town urban legend thing. So it is really playing out like an 80s slasher film. So that's what makes it really fun is kind of like you're living one of those cheesy horror movies. Yeah. Um, Even though the majority of it is just all audio based and you are making these decisions and stuff, but there has been an instance where you do see the killer in action. So I'm assuming he's coming for me at some point and I'm, I'm excited for that. I'm looking at the Steam page, it looks really cool. I like the graphics of it. Yeah, it the looks visuals good. are great. The it's on sale right now, sixty percent off. It's nine ninety nine. In case anyone is interested in this game, I know you yeah, have, it, so I'm probably just gonna play yours. But yeah, I'm doing a uh, let's play of it. So oh, by cool. the time this goes up, I think the first video will be up. So it'll be running into the month of October. I'll have like probably three or four videos of it. Is probably how long it'll take me to get through it. So. If you want to watch that, you can. I want to I want to do a better run than yours where it's like a you death probably free, could. Nobody dies. You probably I could because I've gotten some folks killed. I bet there's multiple endings to it, too. That's exciting. I oh, like I'm sure there is much like the quarry is what that's reminding me of on a much smaller scale. But yeah, where the, as people die, the story changes. So I, that's that's a cool idea. Yeah, I've definitely gotten some folks killed. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so it, there's a very good possibility you could do a better run than me. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Is there any indie titles on your radar that are coming up or that you're interested in? Ooh, man, every day, every day, it seems like it adds something new to the list. I just watched a video this morning and I cannot remember what stood out to me as October releases, but I sure. really want to play Core Keeper. I know I mentioned it last time, but yeah. the more I've heard about it, the more excited I am to play it. So Core Keeper is, it's an indie game, obviously, but it's one where you can play up to eight players together. It's kind of like a a sandbox adventure in in the world where you are, exploring, I guess, building your base. I think it's a survival type game in a way. I don't know if you're like, if it's persistent in the sense that you set up a base and then you keep going back and forth to it, or if it is like, 
a regular playthrough of the game. But there's just sure. a lot of freedom to it that's exciting to me and like different things you can do or adventures you can go on with up to eight players and got a nice like uh, overhead pixel graphics. So it's just been one that I've really been wanting to play, but I don't know if it would be satisfying for me to play it alone. And that's the only thing that's really kind of yeah. kept me from that. So TBD well, maybe we'll on, play it sometime. Yeah, hopefully two players will be enough and we can set some up cool with it. But. I don't know. We'll see. From looking at it, it reminds me of like almost like Stardew Valley meets Moonlighter, but yeah. for eight players. Yeah, and probably more combat heavy than either of those. Sure. It but looks cool though. Yeah, yeah. I'm really I really dig the style of it. So I think that would be really fun for a dedicated group. So oh, big I don't time. Know. There's a few on my radar that I just learned about recently. Two are coming out this month that I just want to mention. One of them is just a really small horror game that I just, you know, I love those kinds of games. Uh, it's called Bring Me dot dot dot. Literally, the ellipses is in the title. It's just a short little walking sim horror game where you play as a woman caring for her sick father. And she's trapped in like a time loop and like creepy anomalies keep going on. And you have to figure out how to break the cycle to escape it. Uh, so that's coming out on the 20th. And then Bloomtown, which I kept seeing videos on like TikTok for it. So then I finally checked it out on Steam. It looks fun. It looks like it's basically like Pokemon meets Stranger Things is basically what I can tell from it. And that just seems fun. It looks like there's lots of creepy stuff in it, but it does seem to be a monster battler style game, which just sounds fun. I was, I was just going to say one that did come to mind as I was thinking about it is Wizards of Legend 2. That's coming oh, okay. out because the first one is such a good game. And this one's kind of ma- moving it to where it's um, more 3D graphics and, than pixel ones as like the original one was. But it still looks really sure. good. So uh, Wizard of Legend 2, I can't say much more about it, obviously, because it's not out yet. But it looks really good. And that's one I'm excited about for October. I remember Wizard of Legend, but I never played it. But. I remember watching the trailer for that back when that first came out and that it looked pretty cool. So, yeah, it looks like October 3rd is the release date. Awesome. The last one that I was thinking about was called Wonder Stars, but this doesn't come out until 2025 and it doesn't have like a very secure date to it yet. But it's a turn based RPG based off of like 80s and 90s style shonen anime like Dragon Ball and Ranma one half. So Mm. kind of like a. Not, I don't want to call it cutesy, but like a, a very Dragon Ball, you know, young Goku ish style, like girl character that does like fighting and stuff. And it is all turn based RPG styles. Like you're picking what you're going to do to attack. I, it, it's not tactical, it's more like, you know, them like really big on the screen and you're choosing their moves almost like a Pokemon setup as far as that goes. But the art style looks amazing. So that is really the big thing that turned me on to it. The audio in the trailer sounds pretty awful. Uh, so mm. that that was kind of makes me pause a little bit. But that just might be the creators voicing everything just because they haven't hired the voice actors for the game yet. I'm not entirely sure. But the game itself, as far as how it looks, it looks super cool. So that's Wonder Stars. It's one word. And I just Thought it looked amazing. Really excited to see what happens with that. Okay. What? Sorry. The more that we're talking about this, the more I'm, I'm remembering from that video I watched. <laughs> so Streets of Rogue 2 also one okay. that has been on my radar for a while because I really enjoyed the first one. Uh, this is another sandbox title similar to Core Keeper. I just... Can you, can you see the pattern? I just like sandbox I do games where I can, I can do I whatever I want. That's like what I enjoy about it is like I don't have to approach something from one sta- in one standard way. I like games that are like that. And this is another one that is along those lines. The first Streets of Rogue was more of a roguelike, hence the name. But this one is an ongoing story kind of thing where apparently you are teaming up with friends and doing, doing it in whatever way you want. But... Your goal is to topple a corrupt president in whatever way you want to. So that <laughs> that's such an interesting concept to me. But Perfect. there's just this is one where it looks like a lot more chaotic than sure. something like Core Keeper would be. But 
think of it like a if GTA were more. I, I guess like bombastic. I guess like if you could do a okay. lot more things, a lot things that were not necessarily as grounded as GTA is. Sure, but you're okay. still stealing vehicles. You're still like, but you in the same way you can also like use a growth serum to turn into a giant and like crush buildings and stuff. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot more fantastical, but I also like it. seems like a lot of fun. And it's multiplayer as well. So this is one we got to get into when it comes out okay. on October uh, 22nd. I do love when games, especially when they're like supposed to be kind of 80s beat em up games, when it's always like the mayor or the president is always yes. like the final boss, like that Double Dragon remake that we played. <laughs> so that's, good. That's that's great. It's yeah, always got to be the mayor or something. Because we knew, we knew from the start, it's yeah, like, oh, it's going to be the course. mayor. Even though the mayor's on your side, it's like he's hiding like this buff body under this suit. You know he is. And of course, <laughs> oh, he totally was. When you get to the end, he rips the suit off and he's just rippling with muscles. It's awesome. <laughs> he just turns into All Might. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's always the mayor. It's always the mayor. It's so good. Oh, man. Well, that'll do it for this episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And if you did enjoy this episode, please do us a favor and share it with someone who loves indie games. If you want to see some more content for Shogun Showdown, you can watch me play this. You can see my first run over at our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash nerdsloth, where we also have extra bonus podcasts and all kinds, hundreds of hours of extra content. My name is Chris. I'm Joseph. And keep playing through that long backlog of indie games. And we'll see you in a week. See ya! Indie Game Arcade is recorded and produced by NerdSloth Creative. If you're looking for more gaming content, head over to youtube.com slash nerdsloth. For additional podcasts, go to nerdsloth.com. If you'd like to support the show, there are multiple tiers available at patreon.com slash nerdsloth with hundreds of hours of bonus content from everything we do at Nerdsloth Creative, including bonus gameplay videos of the games we talk about on the show. The theme music for the show is Retro Game Tapes by Audio Lime. If you'd like to get in touch with us, or if you're an indie game developer and would like us to consider reviewing your game, send us an email to podcasts at nerdsloth.com with the subject line Indie Game Arcade. 